Hi there, and welcome to the Creative Endeavor Podcast. This is the podcast bringing you inspiring stories from creative professionals from around the world. And in this episode, I'm talking to a photographer, someone who is an incredibly talented image maker. His name is Will Patino, and he's based in the South Island of New Zealand. Now, I've been following Will on Instagram for a while, and his images are just breathtaking. This guy has a way of capturing this unique landscape down here like no other that I've seen. His photographs really speak directly to my soul. There's something in them. He just captures a moment. So this was a great opportunity to talk to a professional photographer who's just got amazing skills. Now, Will didn't start off as a professional photographer. He was originally an air conditioning technician. And from there, he found his passion and that ended up completely transforming his life. He really opened up to me as well about mental health issues, some things that he struggled with over the years. And this became a really fascinating conversation into the things that seem to plague a lot of us creative professionals. This is one of those conversations that went just about everywhere and I got so much out of it. I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's Will Patino in the Creative Endeavor. Well, Will, welcome to the Creative Endeavor podcast. It is an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you, mate. It's uh, it's a pleasure of mine. I've been a fan for quite a while, particularly of the podcast as well. And uh, I never thought you'd have a photographer on here, actually. So I feel quite honored, mate, to um, have the opportunity. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I got to say, like, since starting to follow you on Instagram, and, and look, I'm not just saying this because you're sitting right here in front of me. I- I've looked at so many photographs of the South Island in particular. You take some of the most breathtaking photographs I've ever seen, and you've got quite a following on Instagram as well. So I thought it might be interesting to have a conversation and see how you how you've made that work as a business. But let's kick things off by hearing a bit about how you started this and and where your creative journey began. Yeah, cool. Thank you, mate. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, get comfy then. We'll go in for the long haul. Um, delve yourself back to. I think it was around 2012 is when I first picked up a camera. Um, I spent most of my teenage years as a skateboarder. I got into skating. So I'm from Australia originally, and um, I live in New Zealand now. But uh, in Australia, I think when I was 13, I picked up a skateboard, mate, and I just fell in love with it. And it was my life. I just lived and breathed skating for a decade at least. And as I got into those later years, into my early 20s, um, I got married when I was 21, and not long after that, obviously, the skateboarding really just started to uh, fade out of my life. But a lot of my good mates were still in that skating scene. Some of them were a little bit younger. And um, I remember I used to always love filming uh, me and my mates skating, just taking videos, chopping them up and putting a bit of music together and all that type of thing. So I, that was probably my first creative outlet was just, just doing some videography like that. And then as it got towards that back end where I wasn't skating as much, wasn't seeing my friends as much, I remember some of the guys invited me on a like a weekend skate trip and I was in a bit of a hard place at the time. I was having some mental health struggles. Um, I was I had depression. I was diagnosed with depression and just getting out of bed was even a struggle. And I remember this skateboarding trip, you know, I hadn't skated in probably weeks or months at that point. And I thought, oh, I'll just go and maybe maybe I'll just try to take some still shots instead of video, which, which is what I did in the past. And um, so I did that. And on that same trip, there was a friend of mine, a good friend who was a commercial photographer. And sometimes he would get photos published of some of the guys skating. And there was a shot that I took of one of my friends and my, my photographer buddy, he saw that shot and he was like, man, yeah, that's a really good shot. Like, you should be proud of that. And that positive uh, feedback, I, I just still remember it to this day. It just made me feel like, like a bre- uh, you know, breathing fresh air, and that really got me thinking. Oh, maybe, maybe I could keep trying this photography thing. This is pretty fun, you know. I get to hang with the guys, and it's kind of interesting just to explore, you know, compositions and stuff. And when I got home from that uh, skateboard trip, one of the boys said he, he shared the photos online, and I couldn't remember what he said at the time. So I jumped on uh, the phone, I think it was like the iPhone 3, you know, this is back 2012. And I I just put in photography in the app store and Instagram popped up. 
had no idea what it was. I was not on Facebook. This is when Facebook was booming, but I was that one guy that didn't have Facebook. I just wasn't interested in social media at all. And I saw this Instagram thing and it mentioned photography. I thought maybe that was it. So I downloaded it. Sure enough, it wasn't what where he shared his photos, but I was like, oh, looks kind of interesting anyway. Maybe I'll just keep using this Instagram thing along with the photography and see what happens. And yeah, long story short, mate, that's basically what happened. As I started using Instagram, I then started seeing landscape photos and once I saw them something in me just clicked you know my mother was was into oil painting my grandfather and then when I saw the photography the landscape photos it just made me go man I just want to try that so I had that this camera which I was using for the skateboarding I thought maybe I'll go down the beach one morning and just try shoot a sunrise and once I did that it was no going back. I still remember that sunrise as clear as day. I, I just went down. I lived in Wollongong on the south coast of Australia, and uh, we had lots of beaches within a five, ten minute drive. So I just went down one of the main beaches, and that was that was a mission in itself because I used to sleep right in till the last minute before I went to work. I used to be an air conditioning mechanic, um, so just to get out of bed and go to the sunrise was like you know a big deal to me. And then watching the sunrise and yeah, taking a few quick happy snaps. By the time I got to work later, I was like, wow, I feel like I've actually had an amazing day and the day is only just beginning. I felt like I'd won. It didn't matter if I had a bad day then. I'd already had that one hour to myself and had a bit of time to just switch off and you know do something creative. And that's where the journey began. And it was basically a process of uh, exploring. That was the main thing that drove me, just exploring the coastlines where I lived like never before. I was finding all these places I didn't even know existed, even though they were maybe 10, 20 minutes from home. And then using Instagram, Instagram back then was had such a cool community vibe to it. So when you'd share work and engage with people, there was no businesses on there. There was no celebrities on there. So that really helped me just be encouraged to keep doing the photography as well. And then coinciding with the, the mental health battles that I was having, it all just come together as a perfect fusion. I was just, you know, getting outdoors, which was a big thing. I was being creative and then I was engaging with other people. It was just the perfect recipe. And then I think two years later is when I eventually quit my uh, job and made photography a full-time career if I was going to fast track that last little bit there. <laughs> that's that's awesome, man. What a that, what a story. So tell me, I, I just, there's a, something that's really got me intrigued. Just, you were like really one of these early adopters of Instagram back when it, uh, you know, was just starting to take off. When was that app launched first? Was it 2012 it first came out? No, I think it was maybe 2010, maybe. Okay. Uh, And the the Instagram account that I engage with you on now, that's not my original account. I actually have two accounts. So the first account that I had, yeah, yeah. So the first one I had, it's got maybe 170,000 followers. I don't know exactly what it is because I don't really use it anymore. Um, but that account, I, I, I was in Australia. By the time, say, I had about 10,000 followers, there was literally maybe five of us in Australia, five people that were dabbling with a camera that had that many followers. And that wow. initially opened up the doorway to me getting some income from photography. I was, uh, you know, it sounds silly now, but the word influencer, I remember when that word was just started to get thrown around and used with you know, me and a few other people. And we were like kind of at that forefront of being those first influencers um, in Australia. It was really quite surreal to look back upon. Mm. Uh, And yeah, because I had, you know, a a following that was bigger than most at that time, obviously it was just the perfect marketing tool. But then what happened with myself is as the years rolled on, that account started growing, the engagement uh, and algorithms changed everything. But I I changed as as a person and as a photographer and that's why I actually started the second account which is maybe two years old and that's what I call my main account now um, but yeah I was really I was one of those early adopters I probably missed that first wave by maybe six months I've got a few friends who were who got on there six months before me and they were already at like 50,000 followers within six months it was so much easier to grow back then you know the there was something called the popular page which these days they use the explore page and that's curated for the individual so everyone's explore page today is different from the person next to you but back then the popular page was global there was maybe only 50 posts but if you got your work on there 
you were exposed to the whole world and it was quite it wasn't easy to get on there obviously but once i started getting a few images on there maybe once a week if i was lucky who knows you could gain 500 uh, new followers within a night once you got on there man like that was it everyone wow. in the world could see your photography um and that just really helped a lot of early adopters to grow essentially um and then of course they slowly started tightening the screws as the years have rolled on but that was initially what helped me get a bit of a build up of a following i wouldn't say that was the main thing though prior to that it was more just trying to post consistently trying to um you know keep a, a quality to a certain standard but keeping in mind i'd only just was learning photography so the quality back then was nowhere near what people are doing now but there were so many less people on there so someone like myself who would you know do a very basic landscape photo if you go back eight years that just stood out like a sore thumb because there's no professionals on there you know so or you take a pretty sunset picture and people going oh wow that, that's quite different compared to today where it's just completely saturated with a million people doing the same thing but yeah back then um it was just easier to stand out it was much more organic and it really helped me you know get to where i am today essentially I mean, again, I mean, yes, I agree that the, the, the marketplace in terms of social media it is saturated with, with images, especially pretty landscapes. But when I look at your work, I'm like, whoa, man, like it takes a lot for a photograph to really just hit me. And there's something about your pictures, dude, that just really hit me. I, I want to go back, though, again, to that to that time, that moment, because I, I reckon as a photographer, even, you know, being an early adopter on Instagram, you've got your work cut out for you. So what was that moment like when you first sold a picture and then realized that this was something that you could actually do to derive an income from? Well, yeah, thanks again, mate. It does, it does mean a lot. Uh, so thanks for those kind words. Uh it's funny, man, because I I had people saying to me, oh, when are you going to make this your career? Because I was working as a tradesman, you know, 40-hour week, uh, just slogging it out on the tools. Photography would be sunrise in the morning, sunset in the afternoon. And because I loved it so much and it was helping me be a, a better person, essentially, I was just doing it every day, every morning. I didn't really understand what good light was or bad light initially. So I, I, I just really... Um, I got a lot of hours up quite rapidly early on compared to a weekend warrior who might only be able to go out, you know, once a week. So I was just really being fueled by it, but I never had any desire to make it a career or make money from it. It just, it didn't come into my mind. It's just not why I was doing it. And then it was probably when I started just to get a few companies reach out for um, like the influencer work that I remember going to Canada and being around the Wit Sundays, Tasmania, just, all over the place and it was purely you know you could take a half okay photo and you got a bit of a following in there but even though I was, I was making a few bucks from that and I, I'll take annual leave from work and disappear for five days at a time whatever it was I still didn't think I'd want to or could make it a career and I remember eventually uh, creating a website and selling a few prints and that was just such a, a privilege and an honor to you know someone wants to put my own photo in their house and even then, I just thought, no, nah, there's no way I could make a, a career out of doing this. You know, like you'd have to be turning over <laughs> 20 prints a week or something like that. How do you keep reaching these people? So I really went for a few years of making a little side income from photography, enough to, you know, cover some new gear or anything like that. And I was content with that. I was content. I remember saying it to my wife, like, oh, if I could just cover the cost of, you know, these lenses or now, unfortunately with photography, mate, it's just a never ending or initially when you're learning anyway, you buy one thing and then you, oh, I want to buy that now. And you just, the, the price keeps going up and up and up. And it's not good for a married man like myself. So uh, we thought, you know, if you could just sell enough prints to cover the cost of the gear, then, oh, that, you know, that's amazing. So I was quite content doing that. Um, and then funny enough, it wasn't until my son, Judah, was born uh, so Judah's five and a half now and when he was born in uh, 2014 right at the end of 2014 obviously life just completely changed um, I was working full-time my wife was working full-time I was doing photography in all my spare time now my wife was going to be home raising our son and my photography was going to be you know the time behind the camera was going to be reduced big time because now I'm a father and he was only about two and a half months old where 
there was a few things that were happening at work where, where I, I wasn't able to get home as early as I used to or something like that. And it just hit me, man, where I just went, you know what, like, I want to be able to see my son when I want to see my son. It's, it was really selfish, but I just remember kind of thinking like, I don't want a boss telling me that I've got to work back today. And because my, my head and heart was already set on getting home. And that was the first time where I thought, far out, I wonder if I could make photography work. You know, what if I started saying yes to more of these influencer jobs and whatnot? But the main thing that really gave me the confidence was that I started running workshops. I started teaching people um, out in the field just on the weekends, maybe a sunrise, maybe a sunset. I started doing little groups of four to five people for sunset and then do some night photography afterwards. I started dabbling in that. So when I had this um, moment at work where you know, I thought, you know what, maybe I could make a living from photography full time. The workshops was the main thing that I, I thought that's that would be the option for me. It's not going to be trying to turn over millions of prints. I don't want to be this travel influencer photographer because my heart's not there. You know, I want to create photos from within. I don't want to take photos to publicize a place. And then I thought, geez, if I start offering workshops outside of Australia or maybe just longer ones in general, and I just started to crunch the numbers, I started thinking about it. And it literally, it's funny. So I, I went from being taking photos for two, two and a half years straight, not ever thinking about making it a career, and then suddenly saying, maybe I could, quitting my job that next week. And then doing it two weeks later. So when all this time saying to people, no, 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 I'm not interested, can't do it, no way. And then just saying, geez, maybe we can, putting our heads together. And then once that seed was planted, mate, I, I, my personality, it's um, I'd rather give it a try. And if I fail, then so be it. But I don't want to die with that regret just lingering for the rest of my life. And that's kind of been the story of my life, you know, and that's why I'm here in New Zealand as well. That's why we've moved countries. It's just I want to give something a try. If it's on my heart and on my mind, then just give it a try and see what happens. And yeah, it's been it's been over five years now, just somehow providing for my family full time of uh, primarily running workshops and then just, you know, occasionally selling prints and tutorials and things like that. But that's yeah, it's funny, mate. I, I still can't believe that we're here doing this and. And I'm just so glad that I just went for it and I, I didn't suppress those feelings. Um, and I feel like my former self would have done that. I feel like I really had a change in my mid-20s, whether it was related to mental health and just photography in general. But I feel like the teenage me, just the younger me, just wouldn't have been interested. I, but now I just I just have this completely different outlook on life. So Let, let me just ask you, because it, this is interesting, because here you are, an Australian, now, you know, calling Tia now your 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 home uh, so you've moved over to the South Island of New Zealand now Tia now for people who don't know is just a stone's throw away from Lawrence where I am uh, so it's interesting so what, what when was what was the year that you decided you wanted to make the South Island your home yeah it's a it's another funny story it's a similar scenario where it was a bit of an idea but never thought it would happen and then suddenly it was like maybe we should. And then we did it. Um, so I think it was 2016. I was coming to the South Island a lot for running my tours. So I'd leave Australia. I'd come here for a week. I'd run a week long workshop and then I'd go back to Australia wow. and then I'd go to, and then uh, during another month I'd go maybe to Iceland or Patagonia, can, uh, you know, Canada, whatever. Now don't, I'm not doing this back to back. You know, I've got kids, so I don't want to be traveling all the time. But what I'm getting at is when I would go back to Australia, Wollongong, where I lived, which is about an hour and a half south of Sydney, it just started getting to the point where I'd go there, I'd go home, but it didn't feel like home anymore. It, it just, and it's probably because I was leaving to go to these amazing, amazing scenic remote places, and I'd go back to Oz, and I'd be like, this is just a rat race. Um, I, I just didn't feel like I was connecting with people anymore. I couldn't relate to people. It seemed like everyone was on a different wavelength to what I was on. And New Zealand was just that place of comfort. We would come here for family holidays. So I'd come here for my workshops. And then I started coming here for personal, uh, just creating imagery in general. And it just got to the point where when I was flying out of Queenstown to go back to Australia, yeah, I'd look out the window and, I, I felt like I was leaving home. And I remember saying to my wife, you know, I said to her one day, oh, you know, I, I think we should live there. I think I texted her when I was here in Tiana. 
said, I think we should live here one day. And I remember the reply she said, of course you do. You know, it was just like one of, another one of Will's bright ideas, you know. Um, but she was just saying it jokingly. And when I got home, I said, ah, oh, like, I don't know. I just, you know, and it, same thing. We started going through the scenario, the, the lifestyle here, raising the kids in this environment. My connection with Fiordland. So where I live in Tiar now, this is the gateway to Fiordland National Park. And Fiordland is a place that is just, it just strikes me in the heart. You know, I think about it, I get emotional. So, you know, we started going through it all and um, it, it went from being, oh, maybe it could be in five years to being, oh, let's just start looking at the houses and then oh, let's just book a holiday. We'll go over there and see what it's like from a living perspective. And then it went, that was mid 20, sorry, mate, it was 2017, mid 2017. And then by the end of 2017, we moved here. So we had about a five month window where we started telling family, hey, we might move over. And then that November, we moved over. So I think, yeah, and then we had all of 2018 and 19, yeah, so two and a half years now. So I've got to do the math on my hand there, but um, yeah, so two and a half years. <laughs> that story parallels our story, Rachel and my, my story. Uh, just, it's, it's almost funny how close that is. It was 2016 for us. We had done an art tour, an on plein air adventure uh, with uh, oh, awesome. 20 of my students from Australia, a few from New Zealand as well. So we came over here, did a painting workshop, and it was the last day of the workshop. Everybody had flown home, and we were walking along the marina in Queenstown. And uh, we were only going to be there probably another night, fly out the next day. And we're looking at each other. And I can't remember if it was me that said it to Rachel or she said, no, she's putting up her hand. You said it to me, right? Okay. She's right here. Yeah, with she's going to take the credit. She, yeah, she's going to take the credit for this one. And it was like, hey, <laughs> if you could live here, why wouldn't you? It was just kind of like this, <laughs> this duh moment. If we could do this, why wouldn't we just do this? And I was like, yeah. huh, we, we had actually moved over. I had grown up in Perth, so a Texan born, uh, lived in Wellington for a little bit as a boy, moved over to Perth when I was 10. And I'd grown up in this place that had no topography, no character, fantastic weather, beautiful people. It was a great place to grow up. Don't get me wrong. It's fantastic. Um, and I still got a gr <laughs> lot of great friends over in Perth. But I, I remember thinking like, I just needed some some of that power and inspiration and landscape. And, yeah. and we we're walking along the marina and she just was like, hey, if we could do this, why wouldn't we? And that, <laughs> I think it was within a, about a year we were here. And um, so awesome. again, mid-2017, we moved over. <laughs> Uh, we, we packed the, the container full. We ended up moving in straight away with uh, Rachel's parents as a bit of a base to then find where we would actually and end that's up. What I did. Yeah. Yeah. We did the same thing. We packed up and shipped everything, and we had a bit of a transition where we were living with my wife's uh, folks for a while there as well, man. But I'm, I think I heard you say in a recent podcast that you've been here two and a half years, and I remember thinking yeah. to myself, oh, that's just kind of creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just crazy. So, but I mean, look, you live in a phenomenal area. I mean, look, if people haven't been to Tia now, I mean, if people have visited and they've gone over to visit Milford Sound or Doubtful Sound or, man, that is, it's a draw droppingly beautiful place. It's one of my favorite places on the planet. I mean, that, that valley, as you're driving out of Tia now, you start heading towards the Homer Tunnel. Uh, Get out of town, man. Come on. That, that drive, is, man. Oh, and yeah, we, we first come through here in 2014, just my wife and I, when she was pregnant with our son, it was like the last holiday type thing. And we'd done the States, Canada, Europe, New Zealand was like, oh, we'll do that later on in life because it was so close to Australia. We thought, why would we go there, you know, for a holiday? And we come here in 2014. I remember just saying, I'm an idiot. Like, this is only two and a half hours from Sydney and it looks like this, you know, this is insane. I remember doing that drive. And I just made it. It's, it was just the most amazing drive I've ever done. And now I live here and I, I've driven it countless times. And to this very day, I still I still love it. And I miss it now um, because I haven't been able to get out as much given the current circumstances. But um, it's just an amazing part of the world. And now that I live here and even prior to moving over, I've been able to, to explore so much more because because that route is, you know, one, that's probably 0.4 of a percent of what Fiordland National Park is. And even driving that road alone is enough to satisfy, you know, most artists. But now that I live here and have been able to dedicate lots of time just getting out into the backcountry more and more, it's just this place is, it just, it feels like a spiritual home for me when I'm out in the wilderness here. I'm, 
and it doesn't have to be remote wilderness. It could just be park the car and walk for 20 minutes into the beech forest. But there's just something here that it really, it, it stirs something up inside of me and it just really, it, it settles me, it grounds me, it puts everything into perspective. And from a creative um, perspective, it's just there's unlimited options and the type of weather and atmosphere that Fjordland is renowned for is the type of imagery that I like to make. So, you know, it's just, I feel so blessed to have that in the back, in the backyard, but also to live in a town that is big enough to, you know, still have a good size school for my children. And there's a lot of people here. We've made some good friends. So it's just for us, it feels like that right combination of everything. And, you know, it was, I didn't really have any uh, fear with making the move over. The hardest part was just leaving our families. But once we got here and settled in, you know, there, there was a few little unknowns, mainly about um, just the, the community itself and everything like that. What are the people going to be like? You just don't know that stuff when you're, you're holidaying. And um, it's just been a blessing that it's exceeded all of our expectations. So there's no regrets at all. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. I, I can Look, I do want to just back up a little bit, but before we lose that thread and talk a bit about the the business side of things, and I want to kind of preface this because I almost hear people out there listening to this conversation going, okay, both of you guys are living in beautiful locations. Must be nice. Must be nice, you know, Will, doing what you're doing, mm. living in, in your dream location. How do you do that? How's that yeah. working out for you? How, how do you ever make that work? I want to go back to where you started to set this up as a business, right? And um, when you first started teaching workshops, because again, I think there's some parallels there as well. Because uh, I remember that time when I started teaching workshops and started discovering my love for teaching other people. Mm. Um, but before I, you know, launch into my own story, I, I want to hear yours. I want to hear, like, how did you, how does one, let's say you, you're somebody out there even, and, and you, you've got a passion in something, you know a little bit of something about it. Maybe you're considered a, a bit of an expert. How do you even reach out and start putting together a group of four, five, ten people to just fill a workshop? How did you do it? Yeah, good question. I want to hear your side of things, of course, as well, mate. Uh, for me, I wanted to be a teacher at one point when I was in high school and you start exploring career options. I remember thinking, oh, it would be cool to be a teacher just to have that impact on someone's life. And I actually did some work experience at a primary school and that just scared me. I was like, no, I don't want to do this because I was dealing with younger children. Um, but I think I've always had that desire to teach. And when it came to the photography and the business side of it, I, I wish I could remember the first workshop I did or how it came up. I don't know if it was just a one-on-one -on -one or maybe I did a small group one to start off with. It must have been a one-on-one, -on -one, but I was really thankful. And this is why, you know, I mentioned Instagram earlier, how it did help me establish the career I have now. And it's funny because I have a love-hate relationship with social media in general, but I'll always pay my respects to the opportunities that it's opened up for me. So back then, Instagram was my main uh, reach uh, to connect with people, as it is for many to this very day. And it must have just been putting some, I really, oh, I can't remember. I must have just thrown something out on social media or maybe I actually feel like someone reached out to me. I feel like someone in the area might have emailed me and said, hey, love what you do, do you teach? Or maybe it was a comment on social media. And I started perhaps getting a few of those. And I think that's where, and I believe initially it was, oh, no, no, I don't do that. You know, that was a scary concept. Like, no, not me. How could I share something with you? I'm just learning myself. And I think I suppressed it for a while and then I just reached a point where I thought, why can't I? You know, I, I feel like I could contribute to this person's learning in some way. I may not know at all, but perhaps I know a little bit more than they do. So I believe it was just initially saying to someone, let's meet at this place at this time, you know, and we'll go from there. And yeah, I do remember now, it was just a person, just a private one-on-one -on -one down on one of the, the seascape locations. We're real lucky where I live because we had some really dramatic seascapes, big uh, sea stacks, you know, rugged spires and caves and things like that. And I just remember the person's reaction after the lesson, and it probably only went for two hours, but they were just so stoked. They were so I, especially when I just show them a few things with the camera and just seeing their eyes light up. That's what's funny about photography is you, you're combining the technical with the technology. 
with creative. It's an unusual fusion. You know, it's not like painting where it's just coming out of your hand. The cam- you need to understand the technical side of how a camera works and, you know, aperture and ISO and all these confusing terms when you're first learning before you can even really put your whole creative side into it. And yeah, I just remember how rewarding it was seeing this person go, it was like a revelation to them. Me just saying a few things that I took for granted, just completely changed the way they viewed it all. And that instantly made me go, wow, that was cool. Like this is so rewarding to be able to share that knowledge. And from there, it was just baby steps of, um, oh, maybe I will, you know, if someone asks again, I'll say yes. And then I think eventually I must have, uh, just thrown it out there. I must have thrown it out on social media and said, I think the first group one I did, I called it Sunset to Stars. And it's funny because I've, I've, I've ran a lot of those now, but I'll never forget the first one because I tried to get a few buddies to assist, a few photographer friends, um, because I was so nervous about having a whole group alone. I could do one-on-one or two-on-one, but not a whole group of people so we came up with the concept and um yeah and that's essentially what it was so it was like sunset for two hours and then go and shoot the stars and yeah and the more you as you will know the more you start teaching the more confidence that you begin to build for yourself but I found the more I've learned because I found for me with my photography a lot of it is just intuition particularly when it comes to say composing a scene I just into it intuitively just look and go yeah that will works my brain just says okay there it is and that's it and when someone says to you but why I actually had to stop and say yeah okay and then maybe they would ask a question about something else all these things that I would not consciously really consider I was being probed on and therefore I started learning more and more and more because I had to start digging into the why why do I do this and even to this day I'm just still always learning by the questions that people are asking so it's it's a real you know give and take type relationship. And I'm so fortunate to be able to do it. And of course, to relive those moments with people who have maybe never seen a a snow capped mountain before, or never stood in a mossy beach forest or whatever it is to take people into those environments and then just see their eyes light up. I'm like, man, yeah, this is cool. You know? So I have no excuse. So I can never take this stuff for granted because I'm constantly being reminded all the time of how spectacular it is. So today I see my role as, you know, I'm a guide because I'm guiding people out into nature. Then I'm the teacher because I'm helping them with their photography. So it's like this uh, fusion of kind of everything. And yeah, I'm super lucky, man. Super, super grateful. Again, that sounds uh, eerily similar to to the way it kind of ended up panning out for me. But um it's that's fascinating, isn't it? To, to me, I, I'm I'm addicted, and I became addicted when I started teaching to that light bulb moment that would go off for one of my students, where they would suddenly understand a concept. But of course, there was that awkward stage before I even got there of having to enunciate what I knew or what I thought I knew. Yes. I very quickly <laughs> realized I didn't know much, and I was like, oh. Yeah. So I so I remember what what I what I actually did, and and I'll, I'll fill you in on, on how I started uh, teaching. I was invited to give a presentation to an art society. Uh, shout out to Alfred Cove Art Society. I wonder if anybody from there listens to the podcast. You never forget your roots. Man. That's, That's it, sure. man. And so they they invited me. Um, and, uh, and the, the president invited me to come down and, and give a presentation. And so I was like, well, how many people are going to be there? And I think, you know, she said something like, oh, we've got about 50 people booked in or something. And I remember there was somewhere close to about a hundred odd people that showed up for that demonstration. I was like, (laughs) Whoa. Okay. So that, that already, and I hadn't really done any public speaking. I hadn't taught before and I just shook my way through that demonstration. I Sorry just, to cut you off. Were you working as a full-time artist at the time? Or? I was, I was. Yes, yeah. Okay. So I, I hadn't gone into teaching, but what had happened previously is the market started doing some weird stuff. So I had all of these really nice expensive paintings that I couldn't sell. So as that yep. market was doing its wobble, I ended up going, okay, well, I'm going to need to supplement my income with something. And I didn't know at this stage that it would have to be teaching. I didn't know that this was going to be something that was going to be a necessity for me. And I didn't even think I was going to like it because I still had in my head, Andrew, those that can't teach. That was just some crap that I'd carried with me for years that I'd picked up someplace. But I I gave this presentation to this art society and um, it was terrible. Like it was awful. (laughs) <laughs> and and I, I shook my way through the whole thing 
and I bumbled my way along. Oh. And then afterwards, people were coming up to me going, that was awesome. I was like, really? I thought I bombed. And they said, that was awesome. Yeah. W- would you do it again or whatever? And then it planted the seed. So what I thought is maybe I could teach a workshop and get some people there. And look, to be truthful, I needed the money. I really needed the money. So <laughs> I came up with this little idea. I thought, okay, well, look, if I could get book a room, right? And I could get 10 people in that room over a period of four weeks, every Saturday, they would come along and they paid me for this workshop that was going to go for a month, one Saturday over a month. So four, four Saturdays, I could charge them $400 a piece. I got 10 people in that room and I just taught them all day, everything I had, I'd have 4,000 bucks a month. That's a thousand bucks a week and then I can make it work. And I suddenly thought, okay, but then I thought, okay, well, this can't be BS. I I don't want to just rip people off and have them show up and say, oh, by the way, you thought you were going to learn how to paint. Sorry. See you later. Uh, I I, I needed to actually have something I could teach them. So I started writing out this curriculum, you know, so to speak, and started trying to figure out what am I going to teach? And this is really where the birth of my methodology came came in because I started realizing I had no idea what I was what I was talking about. So I was like, okay, I, well, I'm going to break this down into its key components, composition, color theory, and then we're going to have a landscape demo and maybe a seascape demo or something like that. What's composition? Well, I don't even know. Yeah. So I start researching, yeah. I start hitting the books and then what's color theory? I have no idea. So I started researching that. <laughs> what I learned as a result of, of the, doing that research and then explaining it to somebody else. Uh, and again, this old saying came back to me of, you do not understand something until you can explain it to somebody else so that they may understand. And, yeah, and again, and, 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 and I just kept repeating to myself, you do not understand something until you can explain it to somebody else so that they may understand. Until I actually understood that concept, I, I, the teaching was kind of off a little bit. And immediately the holes in my knowledge showed up as soon as I started teaching that workshop. Yeah. So the first workshop happened. People seemed to enjoy it. And a few people rebooked because I decided I'd do it again. Word got out. I had a few people on a waiting list and I booked it again. And then again, then again, Perfect. then again. And the, it ended up... Uh, working its way into a fully fledged, you know, art tour of the South Island of New Zealand. And we sold out, we did two of them back to back. And now it's suddenly like, huh, I'm a teacher now. And this is all yeah. before I got on YouTube. This is all before the online stuff. Um, so by the time I get online, I, I sort of had a bit of an idea about how I like to teach and, and, and some of the ideas and concepts. A lot of this stuff was just intuitive for me. I, I hadn't ever taken the opportunity to enunciate what painting was all about for me and what some of these concepts yeah. were. I was just there doing it, but I couldn't tell you sweet stuff all about what it was I was doing. I was just doing it. And yeah. and I think, but again, the other thing for me that, that, that became apparent as soon as I started teaching is just, I, I, I love people. I absolutely love yes. people. And yeah. um, I, I also felt that I was cheated in my own art education, not from my upbringing. My father did a fantastic job teaching me, and I still hold him in high regard and the utmost respect. But he was a sculptor, and so I wanted to be a painter. Um, and, and he took me as far as he could. And then I, I, I was trying to get some information from a tertiary institution, going to art school, thought that would help. It didn't. Uh, but I, I was frustrated. And so I wanted to do a better job than what I had received. So yeah, it, th- those two things put together, it just, it just created this environment and I just loved it, man. As soon as I started teaching that and I was getting that positive reinforcement from people in the class, I just thought, man, this is me. This is my jam. So when I hit YouTube, I just, it, it turned into something it else again. Vision. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, but to get people, I can resonate with. Uh, sorry, man. Yeah, when you mentioned about feeling cheated, I remember when I was teaching people, mm. and I could tell that they'd been cheated by what they had read somewhere, you know, and they were getting frustrated. And then when they'd explained to me what they thought was the right way to do something, I felt a bit of anger for them. I was like, 
no, like that's not, no, no, no. Let me show you. And where'd you learn that? So crap? I can I understand. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like, <laughs> no, like just watch, just watch how it works. And then, and then there's that light bulb. And I remember having self doubt as well, uh, because I, you know, I picked the camera up in 2012 and by 2014, I was doing it full time. So only after a year and a half, I started teaching maybe even after a year. And I just remember always thinking like, Oh, what if they re research later and, because the thing is, like in all art, there's a million ways to get the same result, really. And I just remember always yeah. feeling a bit nervous and doubting myself, like, oh, maybe this is not the right way. But I just had to keep looking at the results and because I'm self-taught 100 percent. I've never watched a tutorial or anything on photography. It's just all been, oh, you know, the odd reading and looking at graphs and things, but mainly mainly trial and error for myself. So there was always that doubt, like, oh, maybe because I would get a client say to me, oh, but blah, blah, blah says to do it this way way or i watched this video and it says to do that and i'd i'd have these moments along the way where i'd be like ah, and just had to keep backing myself and yeah i look back now and i've obviously grown a lot more and i like what you, you said about creating that curriculum essentially i feel like for myself it's probably only been the last probably the last year and a half where i really feel like i'm starting to understand just so much more about what i do why I do the things I do and then how to articulate that to people. Um, and I don't look back and think, oh man, I really didn't teach those people the right way or whatever. Um, but it's just interesting looking back on your own journey and, and just seeing how you evolve so much as an individual. And, and it's funny because you know that you're going to look back on this day where we are now and probably think the exact same thing. Like, oh, I thought I knew it back then. But, and I guess that's the exciting part is that you just never stop growing. Absolutely. You know, that that to me is and it used to when I first started out that depressed me that thought depressed me so much. It's <laughs> yeah, like, sure. when will I get it? And now I'm hoping like, I hope I never get it. <laughs> you know, because there always has to be yeah, exactly. another there has to be another rung on the ladder. Yeah. And it's just a matter of keep That's climbing, it. keep climbing. And I wonder if we had the opportunity you know, from a painter's perspective, if we had the opportunity to go back and talk to Da Vinci, Rembrandt, you know, one of, one of the greats, Van Gogh, somebody who just had this, this voracious appetite for knowledge and creativity. You know, if you could sit down and talk to these people and say, hey, look, um, do you reckon you understand now? Do you get it? I, I bet anything. I, there's no way to prove this either way, but it's my feeling that they would go, I'm still learning. Even right on their deathbed, yeah. there would still be learning, you know? So um, yeah. that that's something that I, I find... Um, as is an essential part of the creative's journey, I think. I feel like, you know, and I don't you know, I haven't really researched this, but for me, the greatest artist, whether it's a musician, painter, photographer, chef, you know, whatever, I'm just going to call them artists, but um, there's this hunger that can never be satisfied. That I, I know for me, I'm not, you know, I just feel like, I, there could always be a better, I could always do a better job. You know, I could go to the most amazing spot, the conditions align. I feel like I did everything I could, but I'm always, I can look back on every single photo I've made and just find little flaws or little ways that I think I could do better. Now that's gotten less and less over the years for sure. But I just feel like there's just this hunger that will never be satisfied. And I feel like that probably is the same with all these great influential people throughout the years. Um, you got to have that desire to keep growing, keep getting better. Because once you, you know, once you become satisfied and you go, no, nah, this is it. I've reached that point now. Then that's the moment that you stop growing, stop learning, stop excelling what you've done in the past. And you can see it in people, man. Like when you when you talk to other people or see the way they write about stuff, you're like, yeah, he's he's in this because there's something inside of him that he he's, he's just trying to f feel that, and, and he probably never will. But that's the beauty of it. That's why it's working. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's like it's like we're trying to to chase this thing and and scratch this this itch, but it's it's the the act of continually just going for it that that keeps this whole thing going absolutely i yeah i i i hope i hope we never we never get to the bottom of that because again it'd, it'd be such a shame for, for any creative it's like when i talk to creatives um in particular like there there's a handful of like well-established artists that uh that i've come across in my career that think they do they've got it all figured out and i i, I remember being so excited to meet these people and there's only been a few Fortunately, just a few, but I was excited to meet these people. Then when you talk to them, it's like, huh, 
you know, th- th- just something just stopped for them. That th- that that development just was halted. S- some of my favorite creatives that I that I get to interact with now, mostly online, are like little kids because they they are so crazily enthusiastic about their subject matter or exploring something new or moving in another direction. And I don't think they'll ever be to the bottom of that that uh, pool of inspiration. They'll never drain that yeah. pool, so to speak. Um, and, and that's, that's hopefully that energy I, I can maintain. Uh, who knows? Who knows? Time will tell. Um, there's, there's a couple of things, though, Will, if I may. I, I just, again, you're, you're raising so many interesting things here in this little chat uh, right now ah, that I, I, do, world, I, 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 well, I want to, I want to go back to something. If you don't mind talking about this, because mm. I get a few people online emailing me about this particular subject. It makes me really uncomfortable because I feel totally ill-equipped to be able to tackle a subject like that. But I'm hoping that we, we might be able to cover a bit of ground here with this. Yeah, right. you, you, were mentioning, you were mentioning something there about mental health. Now, I've had my own uh, issues with mental health uh, and, and various diagnoses in the back, uh, you know, many years ago. Um, maybe some things that I haven't quite addressed for myself personally. But I'm always curious because this seems to be something that goes hand in hand with being a creative. Now, you said mm. that you had an issue with depression, but now you seem to be doing okay, right? So wh- when did you, did you get to a point where you realized, hang on a second, I'm not depressed anymore? When did you, when did you feel like you had that demon whipped? Yeah, uh, more than happy to talk about it too. So I think it's very important. Yeah, look, it, there was no definitive, you've got it, and now it's gone for me personally. Um, and the way it snuck up on me was just like out of nowhere as well. Um, I'd seen family members struggle with depression, people very close to me, and I, I didn't understand it. I tried to sympathize, but I just I didn't, you know, I, I just couldn't understand how someone couldn't really control their own emotions and thoughts and everything. And, I, mate, I don't... Um, I think I was just 23 or something. So we were married, both had good careers, good incomes, you know, on paper, everything was fine. You know, you wouldn't have a reason to get depression or anything. And then somehow, mate, I just found myself in this, this black hole. And I think I was suppressing some kind of emotion for a while. And then eventually it was like, it all just came out. And I literally just, I, 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 just broke down in tears. I was telling my wife how I feel, you know, how just so low and, you know, I won't go down that road too much. And I was basically bedridden. I couldn't even go to work. And I was, luckily my boss had depression himself. Uh, um, he still did have it. He was on medication for it, but he, he sympathized with my vision. So I was able to take time off work. But I remember just being completely bedridden, no drive, no joy in life, no emotion, essentially just numb and a, a, fi- a, a guilt for feeling that way because like I said why should I feel like this this is ridiculous you know and then that guilt drove me further down that road a confusion and then a fear a fear of I can't control you know this feeling and that it made me scared thinking what if I never get out of this you know um and yeah look the the photography I saw a couple of doctors and um and to be honest, the first few I saw, mate, were just, it was 30 seconds of their time. Oh, yeah, yeah, you've got depression, take these pills. And because I'd seen someone very close to me have some very adverse reactions to taking medication, I just, I didn't want to go down that road straight away. Not that there's anything wrong with using meds, but I just thought, nah, I just, I don't want to go there just like that, you know. And I was very fortunate that my wife, you know, she really, you know, and mate, I, I think back now of what she would have had to endure, it just breaks my heart. But, she did a bit of research and she found this doctor who was apparently, you know, good at dealing with this stuff. And she got me in to see him. And this guy just sat me down as a human being and just said, mate, just talk to me, just talk to me about what's going on. And no one had really asked that question yet um, outside of my wife, but to speak to someone who was, you know, um, outside of the situation, it was just like, oh, and I was able to get some stuff. And just speaking to that doctor for 20 minutes actually started to make me feel a little bit better. It was the first glimpse of hope I'd had in weeks or months at that point. And from there, it was, um, he, he said, look, let's just stay off the meds for now. Maybe why don't you try a few things? You know, are you exercising? Are you doing this? Are 
are you doing that? We had a big European holiday lined up that we were literally about to pull the pin on because I was like, I can't go to Europe. I'm like, I'm in no state, you know. And he said, you got to go to that and you really got to try to get there. And so we did all that. And that's when the photography come into my life around that very same point in time. And for me, I see my photography journey. It was always and still is to this day um, that exertion of those feelings I have have inside that seeking for light in a dark world and if you look at a lot of my images and you know that's essentially what it is and when I first started dabbling with the camera I, I felt that uh, negative energy inside of me and that hopelessness start to um, start to fade a little bit and I, I, I'm a man of faith I, I do believe in God and a uh, creator and I have been since my teens and I, I never wandered from my faith um, but it was, it was just, I was hanging on by thread to everything in my life. And then photography was like this tool that just bound everything together and started just pulling me out. And, you know, I'm not saying the photography saved me or anything like that, but it was just such a key thing because it was getting me outdoors. It was getting me thinking and looking at the world in a way like I'd never done that before. You know, I grew up on the coast. I used to, when I was a child, I lived across the road from the beach. Like you throw a rock and land in the ocean. But all through my teens, as I said, I was a skater, couldn't care less about nature. When we went to Europe and other places, I just, I wasn't concerned with the natural um, phenomena or anything. I was just worried about what's for lunch or where are we eating at the, where's the next restaurant, things like that. Photography and, and my battle with uh, depression, it humbled me. It, it really just made me, it floored me and made me reassess the way that I view myself and the way I view the world that we live in. And yeah, so going down the beach, looking at waves, the light scattering across a wave in the morning, I started to find joy in the most simplest of things and starting to find fulfillment in that. I didn't need um, a video game or TV or drugs or alcohol or whatever. I started to get to a point where like, man, I'm so happy just sitting by the beach and listening and watching. And it's been an ongoing journey. And uh, you know, if I was going to scale it of where I was then to now, I'd say I'm 95%, you know, out of where I was. But I feel like it's always going to be a part of me. I just feel like it's my personality to have those depressive thoughts and tendencies. But over the years, I've started to see the triggers um, and I just know tools to to go, oh, hang on maybe it's time I better, I've got to go for a jog or I've got to just get outside, go lift some weights, whatever it is. Or for me, it's often um, just going into the forest. Even I'll bring the camera, but it's not really about photography. It's just about getting out there and taking the time to observe nature and stop thinking so much about me and just more, just being in the moment. For me, photography, it's very similar to meditation because you get in, I get into a bit of a flow state where everything else in life switches off and I can't think about politics or my career or whatever it is you know whatever we're struggling with I can't think about that when I'm looking through a lens because through the lens life is simplified when I'm in nature there's no phones ringing there's no emails there's there's nothing it's just pure nature we're all equal in that moment and you know once <laughs> you're exposing to yourself to that on a daily or weekly basis across the years it, it's helped me get to the point I'm at now um, so you know it was definitely a fusion of a few things and I, I get the question a lot too because I've tried to make my story known to as, as many people as I can as well and it, it is a tricky one because I know everyone's an individual and we've all got our own individual struggles and individual answers um, that, we're, that we're searching for but if I was going to you know throw out advice or anything I know for me definitely just just trying to exercise get outside but it's all the cliche stuff you know and, that, and that's why I don't like throwing it out there and I'm sure you probably feel the same um, but if I was going to say anything, and I do say to people, there's hope. That's the one thing I, I just would love to people to take out from what I'm trying to say about my own story is there's always hope. There's never not a way out for you. There's always going to be someone to listen, someone to lend a hand. As bleak as it may look, as dark as you feel, as numb as you feel, it's it's not the end of the road. There, there is a way out and you you just got to just hang in there. I really appreciate you sharing that story and, and being so open about this because it's, you know, it's rare on the podcast that we, we get an opportunity to talk about these sorts of subjects. I do 
you know, whilst it's important in, in, in a certain respect, I also do feel like mental health issues, depression, all that stuff does actually at the same time get a lot of airtime. But I don't know if it's, a, you know, from my own personal yeah. point of view, if it's for the right reasons or, or what is actually behind this discussion. You know, it's like, oh, you know, we're going to talk about depression. And this conversation was brought to you by Pfizer. And if you're, if you're watching yeah. like mainstream stuff... There's always this little, there seems to be this, uh, uh, yeah, this undercurrent. And I, I hate to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but hey, guilty, I am one. Now, look, I, <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that, though, Will, because, you know, and again, I, I've had my own issues with this personally, but I've seen this in my own family and, and having family members that have suffered terribly with mental health issues. Um, and it, it's, it's debilitating for the individual. And, and my heart goes out to anybody who's suffering with that as an individual. But then for a family as well, it, it does seem to, wow. you know, dr drag the whole family down. I, I have an idea and I, I want to preface this by saying that I, I'm not a professional and I hope my comments aren't insensitive if this causes offense I, i'm an idiot i'm sorry i apologize to anybody but but it's just something that i feel you know i just want to kind of put out there as, as an idea and, and maybe this will resonate with some people i think we've gotten it wrong i think the way we live our lives for the most part is wrong i, I think that there's too much of an emphasis nowadays on the material and not enough on nature and and the spiritual but not enough emphasis on our god-given purpose and i hope people don't mind me kind of evoking that and, and bringing that into the conversation but hey you brought it up so i you know being somebody of yeah. faith too uh, that yeah. does for me play a huge component a huge part in this but i think that when we look at how human beings do life you know from birth and and the way we parent our kids and and look Bless their cotton socks. I know a lot of parents out there are doing a wonderful job and the best they know how. But some of this stuff is cultural. I think at a certain point we have to realize this is just a paradigm and we're all living it and we're all, you know, perpetuating this. We're all pushing this thing further and further down the road. We're kicking that can down the road. You know, we go to school, mm. which to me, school is, again, I've said this in the past, but school's kind of an indoctrination camp where we are you know, regurgitating the same stuff over and over and over again. We're not learning to think for ourselves and we're channeled into these narrow little paths until we can be in a nice little box. And it's like, you're going to go and be an air conditioning technician. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to be a this, you're going to be a that. And meanwhile, you're, you're, you know, you're feeling inside. Well, I want to be a photographer. Oh, I want to be a painter. I want to be a dancer. I want to write songs, you know, and I, it just, to mm. me, I wonder how much of that is the birthplace of a lot of these feelings of loss and anguish and, and kind of this, this, this feeling like we, we've lost a sense of ourselves because a lot yeah. of us don't want to be put in these boxes. And then you end up waking up one day and thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be this person anymore. <laughs> and, and you know, for me, it's come in different forms because I, I kind of knew I wanted to be an artist growing up. That's what I ended up becoming. But I lost my way in, in, in various other ways. And I've watched this with friends and family. And, um, you know, I've, I've had my moments, for instance, when I was too focused on material gain, for instance. And when I had this fixation on the material, like I need to make this much money and drive this car and live in this house and have this, 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 that focus would end up driving me nuts. And I'd end up depressed because I didn't achieve that. You know, it, yeah. shifting my focus caused me to feel different about this. I don't know. How do you feel about that? Yeah, no. Uh, I totally understand and agree basically with what you're saying there. Um, and yeah, that's obviously a huge, you know, <laughs> that can go a million directions with that type of stuff that you've mentioned. But it, yeah, I, I feel like we, um, you're right. We, we live in, and it depends where you live, of course, but um, more or less in our Western societies, you just, you, you tick these boxes or you're striving to tick these boxes because you're told to tick them. 
And I guess you suppress, I wasn't consciously suppressing um, other mode, uh, ambitions or anything like that. It wasn't until I kind of hit a brick wall and I made me rethink my entire life. But I think a lot of people probably would be suppressing their ideas because they don't think it's achievable or they're ashamed to, to try and pursue it. But I also think, you know, we self-medicate a lot. We self-medicate with food, um, you know, alcohol, drinking, TV, movies. There's all these things that we're constantly consuming just because we we do like because oh I've got nothing else to do so I guess I'll either Netflix sit on the phone you know whatever or I'm hungry I guess I'll go and eat A B C D and I just feel like yeah we we just live in these bubbles that are dictated by so many external factors um, and it's not until you, you actually put your foot down and say hang on a minute like. I don't I don't just want to sit through life and go through these motions and just tick these boxes for the sake of it to end up, you know, 60 years down the track, just going, okay, so I just did the same thing as everyone else. And I don't know. I think when we don't, people should explore why, ask why, why should I do this? How, why is this like this? Why am I here? Essentially, um, just ask more questions really instead of just but I don't know man like I'm not a huge conspiracy guy and I, I hope that doesn't sound conspiracy but I think that's a big question why like why why should we do this that way why should I drive that car just because that ad says that that's what this person and this demographic should drive there's um yeah it's unfortunate it's just the society we live in isn't it but you know people people can break the mold for sure and I think um it should be explored anyway definitely I think there is room for you know, maybe, okay, maybe we don't have to go down the conspiracy route, but but I think there is room for some serious questions to be asked here, because I think if we look at this on a societal level, um, you know, some serious questions need to be answered. You know, wh why, why the heck are we doing it this way? It's so obvious it doesn't work. It doesn't work on an individual level. It doesn't work for families. And it certainly doesn't work for a, a culture. I mean, how sustainable is what we're doing actually going to be, really? And I, I, I want to just draw people's attention to something because I think um, there, there's a film that I came across recently. It's good to probably, probably jump right on this before it's taken off YouTube because I think it's so on the money. It's, it's ridiculous. It's called In Shadow, A Modern Odyssey. And it's an animated film, 13 minutes long. And that thing, I think, will cause a few light bulb moments for folks out there. Find that film no, and, and, and watch it. I'll check and, it out. And um, to me, it just it just ties a beautiful bow around the situation that we're living in right now. And it just, for me, I was just like, whoa, man. It kind of, it wrapped up everything from, from you know, our culture and media. I mean, that's another one, man. I mean, losing yourself in the TV, losing yourself in, in music and movies and all that. I've canceled Netflix, all, all, all of the T I haven't watched TV now in months and I can't even sit down yeah. and watch a movie now without going. Yeah. You're programming me. You're programming. Yeah. Me. Like, like I, I see exactly what you're doing and all it does, <laughs> all, all it does, I think is it, well, for me again, I mean, and look, I've just been really open and honest here right now. But for me, it drives a wedge between myself and 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 my mission and my purpose, and also my creator. You know, it, it's 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 distracting me and making me feel like I'm not enough. So I need to reach for the substance, or I need to go for that thing or that thing. When when I could just go, no, my mission here on Earth is to connect with Will and have a co great conversation about creativity or paint that picture or, or, or draw that picture or, you know, spend time out in the garden with my wife. Like that, that's it. But it's, it's amazing how much of the stuff that we watch is either a distraction. It's like, Oh, look at this, look at this flashing lights going this yeah. way or be afraid of this. Ooh, you know, when I turned it off and mm. I just, I just stopped paying attention to that, man, that was a really interesting point. Like, really turned it off. Like, I did. I didn't think I watched much TV, but then I thought, but I've seen the shows that everybody's talking about, so I'm getting this TV yeah. time in somewhere. <laughs> so what am I talking yeah. about? But now I've really turned it off, and it's just, yeah, man, what a difference it makes. Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, we're the same in our household. We do have Netflix, which is for the you know for the kids. You might get it half an hour in the afternoon or something like that while you cook dinner, but um. The, the last time we sat down to watch a movie because I'm, I'm similar to you like if I'm going to invest an hour or two hours to watch a movie 
I want to, I want to grow from it. I want to learn. I want to walk out of it feeling, you know, inspired and uplifted. <laughs> As you know, 99% of the time, that's not what movies do to you. It's just kind of a mind numbing type thing. And I guess that's what I meant about self medicating is we're just, it's just consumption, you know, just turning stuff over. And once I started removing that stuff from my life, even like say Facebook, I took Facebook off the phone three years ago now. And man, just what a revelation. Just get rid of that off the phone just one less thing to be occupying my brain you know and i love where i live here in fjordland because when i leave my driveway you have about one minute before the phone service cuts out and then from then on it's just you and nature and you have no choice but to connect with nature it's just it's awesome man and i feel like you know that connection that i have out there is i feel like that's what we're meant to do that's how we're meant to be most of the time Often I'll go out in the backcountry and you'll just be living, you, you strip back to the bare essentials where it's shelter and it's food. And that's essentially it. And when that's all that you have to worry about, life, you, you have time to, to feel, to think, to ponder, to grow. And I just feel so much better for it, you know, when I, and that's kind of what happened even on a different scale when I was living in Australia, I was here and then go back to Oz and I'm like, this is a different pace. It doesn't work with me. And now it's happening just in the household where you're like, ah, oh, this pace is wrong. We've got to go down the lake now and let's just devices off. And only in the last, I think, uh, three weeks, we've started turning our phones off at night and they don't go on again until 9, 10 a.m. the next day after we've woken up. We've had time as family, we've eaten, we've done a bit of study or something like that. Now the phone comes on and the noise of the world comes in. But my wife and I are just doing that for the last few weeks. It's like, whoa, what a difference this makes, you know. It's amazing when you sit back and you realise how much external noise is trying to get to us all the time and how easily we can all just let it come in and just to occupy our brains. It's um. Yeah, it's a sad state, really, that we live in a society like this. One of the books that my wife and I just picked up a couple of weeks ago is called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it's basically essentially what I was just talking about, where, you know, we, we live in this time where it, I, I I felt like this. Everything was always a rush, you know, whether it's I right, get up quickly, make a coffee, start checking the socials, check the emails, feed the kids, do this, do that. And it's like, man, we're literally all living, most of us are living life like that every single day. And yeah, this book, uh, it kind of basically breaks that down and says, hang on, let's just step back. Let's just learn to breathe and start to maybe remove some of these things or address what it is that's speeding us up and why. And yeah, that's been a good book for my wife and I to um, just reflect on and start to incorporate a few things out of that. So it's, yeah, that's been really good. Awesome. Awesome. I'll, I'll have to check out that book, man. I, I check that, it out. You know, look, any resources like that are really, um, yeah, really important, I think, because again, it's just that opportunity to check back in. And I, I fall victim to this, it, it, like, like everybody yeah. else, I'm sure. It's like you have the tendency to, to pick up that phone, check those notifications, oh, who emailed me, what's coming in, what's going out. And we get caught up and having some sort of structure as well around our day, I, I think is really important as creatives of, of having a way a framework or a system in which we can get some sense of control and, and where we get to decide what's important. Um, now, Hey, look, let, let me, let me ask you something now before, before again, we, we, this conversation wraps up because I, I want to be uh, sensitive to how much time you have as well. But there's yeah, something that I, I, I want to ask. And again, I think we should um, address at some point the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is, uh, you know, coronavirus and the, the pandemic and the situation. <laughs> um, look, when this thing first started rearing its head, I, I was thinking to myself, like, Mm, maybe this could affect us here. This could be interesting because with my workshops that I do, and I only leave the country now once or twice. I'll go to Iceland once a year for a work, run some tours over there, and then I might go back to Australia to see family and do a couple of workshops in Oz. But otherwise, most all my work's in New Zealand. So I've, I've got the clients coming to me. And, uh, yeah, once this started getting a bit more serious, and as you know, it really escalated quite quick, um, it became apparent that, 
all the scheduled workshops I had lined up. So for my workshops that I run, the largest group size I have is six. That's what I like to just stick to. And that, that's six people for a week straight across the South Island. And then I just do lots of variations, um, you know, whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, someone might want a day or a week with me, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever it is. So, and all of those clients, I've obviously now had to postpone to next year because the thing with my business and the workshops is that people are paying in advance so people might book in for you know i'm taking bookings for 2021 so people will pay a deposit and then that outstanding amount they will just be invoiced every second month whatever it is it's, everyone's going to be different um and then they just pay it off so the people that were doing workshops with me this year and particularly this month last month etc they paid those off you know, three, four months ago and the money that they were paying, that's how I feed my children and my wife. Um, so suddenly we were faced with this situation where it's okay, these six people now, I can't run their tour because of this situation that's beyond my control and their control, their airlines are stopped flying, et cetera. I can't refund them because one, you know, I'm covered in my terms and conditions, et cetera. You know, it was a week out from the first trip where I had to cancel it, but also I can't just find you know, $50,000 here or 30 there, whatever it is. It's just, it doesn't work like that. And I've been thankful that, and as you're probably aware, most travel companies have done this similar thing where it's like refunds aren't necessarily being issued, but I've been able to to postpone and say, all right, guys, here's options for next year. And thankfully, of course, you know, most people, everyone's been understanding their airlines have given them credit, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm at the stage now where the next stuff I actually had scheduled was not until June, July, and then September. So I can't, you know, I don't work, my work schedule is weird. You know, I could be home for three weeks straight and then I might be gone for two weeks at a time or who knows what it is. Um, but yeah, like I'm looking ahead now saying to myself, I'm, I think I'm going to have to postpone every single trip for this year, push those people to next year if they're able to do that um so look it's been the, the money's just stopped obviously because the people that are doing trips later on in the year we're not invoicing them anymore because i don't want to take their money if it means i've just got to give it back or whatever so of course the income has stopped one of the saving graces is that i, I started doing some online tutorials i got some buddies out here 12 months ago now actually and we invested uh, two weeks total, just over two weeks of filming out in the field and just making a, a whole series of video tutorials. And it was something that I wanted to try for quite some time. And I wanted to do it in the field as well as on the computer, because with photography, you know, you've got to know the processing as well as the, the theory and technical in the field. And yeah, I'm real lucky that I've got those made already uh, and quite an extensive uh, little collection there, you know, like a good 10 hours or so roughly, maybe more, probably 15 um, across all different categories and, you know, anything and everything really. And that's just been a saving grace because the, the money I, I was had coming in from that, we weren't touching. We we're going to renovate the bathroom, et cetera. We even had the, the builders booked in and the plumbers. And when coronavirus started rearing its head, that was the first thing. Like, guys, we've got to cancel this stuff. You know, we've got to we've got to feed the family off this food now. And to, as we speak right here, right now, the only money I have coming in is just from selling the odd video here and there. So for, for moving forward, um, I, I'm still getting inquiries about workshops for next year, which is a, an amazing sign for me because that was the first question. It's like, are people going to be interested in traveling? Do people have the money? And I'm really fortunate that, what I do, I don't rely on mass tourism. And it's sad because New Zealand in general thrives off tourism and mass tourism. And a lot of people that I know here in town, they have businesses and restaurants that they need to be getting high numbers every single day. Um, whereas for myself, I, I really only need, let's say, 50 people for my whole year. That, you know, just throwing a number out there, but that's probably roughly what it would be six people here, six there, it ends up maybe being about 50 people. So I'm being, you know, pleasantly surprised that there's still been inquiries for next year. And what I'm doing moving forward is investing more time now into my online learning. And I've actually been speaking to um, like an agency in the States who reached out to me and they deal with um, people like myself, professional photographers, mainly in the States states um in helping them sell and market their tutorials uh so and that was quite a timely uh time to reach out with these guys as well so yeah moving forward and what i've been doing literally today and for the next couple of weeks is now all right how can i just build 
my online tutorials and keep building upon a curriculum there that's going to be of interest to other people. So then I've got a nice, solid, even bigger collection of stuff that I can offer. So I really see that, you know, for creatives and, you know, this has been mentioned many times on your podcast and it's, it's no trade secret, but I think, you know, the selling online, like the, the e-commerce is, it's such a big thing now. And it's, it's very difficult depending on what your, you know, art, art is and what your outlet is. But for me, I'm fortunate that I do work in an industry that can flow quite well, whether it's in the field, selling prints, or teaching online or even doing Skype lessons, you know, that's possible as well with photography, just doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, teaching via Skype. So there's a few outlets there. My passion, my passions for being out with people though. Um, you know, every photo I take, it's not really about selling photos. It's funny because I'm a, I call myself a photographer, but as I said before, I'm more of a guide and a teacher, really. Every photo I take is just for me. And it just happens to be marketing for the workshops I run. Um, so if I was going to be passionate about anything, it's aside from going and taking photos, it's being there with people, helping them to get photos. But unfortunately, moving forward, or at least for probably this year, that's probably not going to be what I do. And I'm going to have to shift towards doing things online and honestly mate like I, I questioned is it worth it you know like why I, I, I always use this analogy when I speak to people as far as photography goes and what I do I say to people it's like painting you could be a painter but you're painting houses all day just using a roller or you could be a painter and you're an amazing artist like yourself you, it's still both you know you're technically a painter and I say photography as well. Photography, you could be a photographer, but you're just a real estate photographer. And I don't mean to put down a real estate photographer, but you could just be setting up, getting an interior photo to help sell a house. For you know, there's no real, um, you know, creativity so much in doing something like that. Or you could do what I do, where it's trying to put something a little bit more into the imagery. Um, so when it comes to the situation we're in now, I really had to say, well you know, do I want to be doing online things when that's not really what I'm passionate about or want to do? Maybe I'm better off trying to, to pay the bills another way, just picking up the tools again or something like that. And I have decided, of course, to stick to doing this because I love being my, my own boss and it is fulfilling to still uh, do what I do. But yeah, it's a, it may, and who knows who I just, that's the, tricky thing with this scenario is we really don't know we don't know what one week is doing from the next and so I, and I've never been one to forecast too much anyway I never have not well not since I started this journey anyway it's always been let's just live one day at a time be thankful and grateful for this day and then we'll deal with tomorrow when that comes and because I don't like saying in five years I'm going to be here or 10 years I'm going to be there because I just don't believe that that's the way things work. You know, I, I don't want to try and assume that I can get somewhere or build an empire or something like that. All I'm worried about is how can I be the best person today, put the food on the table and, you know, try walk out having maybe help someone else in their journey. And hopefully I learn something along the way. So that's kind of me moving forward is going, okay, I think it will still be beneficial for my family if I keep being self-employed and going down this direction and, you know, we'll postpone most of the trips for this year and we'll see what happens. And mate, I'm just trying not to try and not let, not let it get the best of me. And I easily could, I could easily go, hang on, you know, my wife, she raises the kids and helps me with what I do. And I've got to provide for the whole family and pay the mortgage and there's no money coming in. But mate, there's, I'm just not going to worry about that. I just one day at a time, just be confident because I, I look back upon my life and I, I look at that decision when I made that I made to do this full time. And there's just been little things along the way, little, you know, coincidences where maybe there was moments of doubt and and then suddenly this um, email would come in and just change everything. And there was times where I'm like, you know what, this, this industry is so saturated now and there's a lot of competition and, you know, there's a lot of undercutting and maybe, you know, maybe I'm, and then bang, that email comes in or an, an opportunity pops up and there's just always these little things that keep pushing me down this path and at this current time I, I still feel like this is the path I'm meant to be on but I, I just try and be flexible with that I just I, I don't want to really get my heart on being a full-time photographer forever I just always try and be lenient with whatever life is going to present and you know whatever God throws at me and that's where my hand has to be at that time then I'll, I'll give it all I can and make do because I, I do believe that you know life is more than 
what we're just doing right here, right now. It just it seems so menial when I look at it about making money and you know just getting through the day. And I'm fortunate to do something that I love, but I I just see it in a bit more of a global spectrum, I guess. So I guess that's why it doesn't it doesn't worry me too much. And I, I if anything, I'm more worried about other people. I'm worried about people's mental health. I'm worried about people that were living on a on a fine line, and this virus has just tipped them over. Um, it's just, it's going to be a hard time. So we're just trying to, you know, make sure that maybe I can help in the community a bit more because I've got a little bit more time just doing some online videos. Now I can go and help someone else get out of trouble as well. So I don't know, just trying to stay open to all possibilities moving forward. But uh, definitely for the foreseeable future, the, um, the the mind is going towards making these new videos and then seeing where they go, where they head essentially. Will that that is awesome, man. That is awesome. It, it, again, it's it's about where we put our focus, right? You know, and and when you were talking there about what you could do with your your the, the business, you mentioned there. I was counting them off in my head, but you were saying there was like four different revenue streams that you could be bringing in digitally while this stuff's coming on. So again, you mentioned a few things there. I, 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 I'm a huge fan of diversification, you know? Again, maybe it's not our central yeah. passion or focus, but as long as it's somewhat related to what is driving us, I think that's okay. Um, but there's something to be said, you know, while all this stuff's going on, reaching out and helping a neighbor, reaching out, helping somebody who, who really needs it. That can, you know, lift your own mood, but it also makes a huge difference to that other person. And maybe we could use a little bit more yeah. of like of that sort of thing now. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's easy to focus on ourselves, And I'm not taking away from people who are genuinely, you know, struggling. I'm not yeah. saying, oh, pull yourself up and, you know, go help someone else. But yeah. I, just from my own journey, the, the times that I've had self-pity and, oh, poor me, it's like, hang on, like just step outside, get outside of that mindset. And, um, and then you, like you said, it, it really boosts your mood and, and makes you realize, you know what, I, I was making this thing a lot bigger than it actually is. Um, so, you know, there's always going to be someone worse off than you and it is rewarding to, to be able to help people definitely. So hopefully we'll be able to use the time to do that. And yeah, so you and I, we both live in tight knit communities, the whole South Island of New Zealand, really, um, all the towns that we live in are quite small. So moving forward, I think people are just going to have to really bind together and work together essentially to try and get through this one way or another. And I don't know how that's going to manifest itself. Um, but even the tourism industry in New Zealand, it, it, it's going to be changed for quite some time now. And even with the online world, like we're very fortunate that we can connect as we are now with families, with our audiences online. And it will be interesting just to see, you know, the, the how this affects the way that we communicate. Um, because I know people have been a bit more active on social media and doing videos and things like that, because we're all aware that all of us are in this situation and a lot of people are alone and things like that. So I'm, I'm curious to see what happens moving forward from that side of things as well. Is it going to change the way we interact and, or, you know, I don't know, I'm a, I'm a little bit pessimistic as well. I, I also feel like we're just going to go back to the same routines and people are just going to get caught up in the wheel again once this thing blows over enough. So I don't know. I don't know what it, what it's going to do there, but it's going to be interesting times ahead. And hopefully hopefully, there's some good lessons that get learnt along the way, whether individually or collectively. Who knows? Time's, time will tell. Uh, yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you. It, whilst that is a concern that we might just kind of pick up and get back on that hamster wheel, I... I think for the first time, well, certainly the first time in my life, uh, but I think this is true for a lot of people out there. Uh, for the first time, we have something that is uniting everybody. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. and, and I, still, I, I still am pretty optimistic personally. I think there's still a lot of opportunities here. You know, now more than ever, more eyeballs are on screens watching online content. And so I think if you're yeah. if you're an artist or a creative out there and you've got some inkling to create visual content online, whether it's a social media page or a YouTube channel or something like that, or start your e-commerce website, do it. Like now is probably yeah. a really good time to do that because you've got eyeballs there ready to consume your material. And uh, that that's yeah. available for everybody. I don't think there's any barrier for entry there uh, at all. Yeah, I, that's such a good point. And what I like about the whole e-commerce side of it is that 
the overheads are quite low. Like, you know, you need a camera and maybe not even a camera, just use the webcam, whatever you use. And also, generally, the, the cost for the consumer is quite low, you know, if you're selling tutorial videos, for example. And that's something that I've been thinking about with what I do because with a workshop with me in the flesh, it might cost, you know, a few thousand dollars for a week, whatever it is. Um, whereas a video, it's 100 bucks, 200 bucks, whatever it is. And I like that because it means, although there could be a lot of people doing it right now and everyone might be jumping on the bandwagon, it doesn't matter because the consumers, they're happy to throw a few hundred bucks here, 50 bucks to that guy next week, maybe next month that guy. Whereas something like buying a grand master painting from you or doing a week-long tour with someone, that's like their yearly or five-year that's it, man. Like they throw the money there and that's all. Whereas at least with, you know, buying and selling through the internet, there's a lot more room to move. There's a lot more fish in the sea essentially. So that, that gives me, that makes me a bit more optimistic and um, inspired to just keep moving down that direction because there's unlimited possibilities. And the ones that the videos that I made 12 months ago, they still selling today. So it's like, great. So that means what I make today could then be selling in 12 months time. So it's, it's almost a no brainer. And I think, I think for people listening, really, you shouldn't, don't, don't let fear hold you back. Don't worry about what you, you think, oh, that, that person's going to think I'm silly for trying to sell these or do this or market myself like that. Life's too short for that. I think just give it a go and you, you'll see what happens. And like I said, you don't have too much to lose, really. It might be a few hundred bucks to set up a website, whatever it is. Um, but I think it's really going to be worth the investment just to try and diverse, just diversify what you're doing a little bit so you don't have all your eggs in one basket. Mm, absolutely. Uh, good point there, Will. Good point there. So, Will, this, this has been a fascinating conversation. I love all the directions that we've been going in here. Um, and it's great just to have an opportunity to connect with you, but also, you know, reflect a little bit on some of what you're saying, because I find it, man, it's just so much of that resonates with me, you know, and I, I, I find that I, I'm kind of reminiscing about my own story there. One of the things that we haven't talked about yet, though, uh, which is an absolute crime. Let's just get this in here into this episode, because I... You know, I, I'm talking mainly to painters and, you know, some sculptors, but mainly artists who are creating stuff. I, I have not had a photographer on the show yet. And I always thought that photographers had their work cut out for them. Like, really, like, if you wanted a challenge, become a photographer. Because what you see pretty much is what you get. Now, I know we got Photoshop and digital stuff like that, but pretty much what you see is what you get with that landscape. But for me as a painter, if I don't like the mountain where it is, I just move the mountain. No big deal. Yeah. For a photographer, hey, you got it's a, that's a bit of a tall order. Tell me a little bit more about your your creative process. What are some of these subjects that are really inspiring you and driving you? And maybe a couple of the technical aspects behind what you're doing. Because again, I, I and I, I don't even really know what to ask you about the technical aspect because I'm not a I'm shooting reference for my paintings. I'm not a photographer, but I look at your work. Man, they're heartbreakingly beautiful. Those photographs, they just they really just hit something in me. They're, they're just amazing work. So anyway, I've asked you a bunch there. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, man. Thank you. Uh, do, yeah, I do appreciate that. And thanks for asking the question as well. Yeah, I feel like I've been on a tangent about everything and uh, hopefully I haven't just been talk talking in circles. Yeah, when that, it comes That's to what it's all about, man. Um, that's, that's what the podcast is all about. So don't worry about that. that that's the beauty of it, right? Yeah, yeah man. Like... It's funny because um, I, I've done one painting for my wife when she turned 19. We, I think she was 18 when I met her and for her 19th birthday. For some reason, I did this little oil painting because my mother was a painter and my grandfather. And I, I was always curious about just giving it a try. You know, I, felt, I wanted to try that outlet, but I found for me, I, I don't know. I don't know why I didn't stick with it longer. I think it was just different priorities at the time. Uh, so yeah, fast forwarding with the photography side of things. Yeah. What I was getting at, sorry, was yeah, with painting, I, I, I often think even to this very day, ah, oh, wouldn't it be nice to just create the exact atmosphere and light that I want? Because with my photography, a lot of the time it's finding the location or scouting it on topographic maps and, you know, seeing that's going to work for a good shot. But then saying, okay, I know that photo needs this type of light. I need the sun over here. I want this type of cloud, this type of color palette, et cetera, all to come together. Because 
you know, I, it's like a portrait for me. With the way I photograph the landscape, it's saying, okay, what's going to make that place, that person look their very best? And I'm just drawn to, you know, I love the the romanticists, the sub, the painters, you know, the, the sublime, that the the terror, beard stud, um, Cole, you know, all those guys. When I look at, and that's where I draw a lot of inspiration. Your work, the, for me, the inspiration comes from the feeling. It's not really um, so much the technical and look. It's if something makes me feel, then I'm inspired. And it just so happens to be that. A lot of the romanticists, the masters, that's the type of thing that I'm trying to do in my photography because I can relate to what they're conveying there. That's that wonderment and awe and a little bit of terror as well. So when it comes to saying, okay, I'm going to go shoot this place, um, it's then saying, okay, what's the type of weather that's going to make it look the best, the type of light? So it's it's really just trying to get there at the right time and time it with the, the essential elements that you need to to make that place shine. Now, now, unfortunately, it's not always obviously it doesn't work out. Sometimes I'll do I do a lot of aerial shooting. I love going up in a plane. It allows me just to get right out in areas that I just wouldn't be able to get to otherwise. And sometimes, mate, you know, you might be forking out a thousand bucks, maybe two thousand dollars, just ridiculous numbers. And you're not going to get up there when there's a storm coming in or, you know, the exact right cloud in that specific spot, whatever it is. So sometimes it's that combination of, for me, getting the, the composition has to be right and the light on the land has to be right. But I, I have a bit of a liberal approach when it comes to, say, atmosphere and clouds. So if I have a piece where, and this might be only 40% of my entire portfolio, but if I have something where, Everything I, I enjoy, the, the composition, the right movement in the water, the the um, the light hitting the landscape, stuff like that is very hard to really fake in Photoshop. If the sky color or the, the, the pattern in the cloud just doesn't work for me, then I'm fine to change that. I don't feel like... Big, my, because I run workshops, I can't go changing everything because I'm taking people there the next week, potentially. Um, so I have an integrity to show a, a place for what it is. But light and atmosphere, that's changing second by second every single day. Um, so that's always going to be different for the next person that rolls along. So I, I do have a bit of a liberal approach there where if I think, you know what, um, I, I wouldn't mind a bit more fog in that valley or something like that. Every now and then that's where I'll be able to get a, a more creative and create that type of atmosphere that I want. But really I'm just trying to get that moment right there, single exposure, because of me, because I'm selfish, because I want to actually experience it first and foremost. If I go to a place and it's just blue sky and it's just not stirring something inside of me, then the camera just doesn't come out. It, it's basically bookmarking the location and saying, I've got to come back here at the end of a storm when I've got this type of light, this type of moisture in the sky, creating that haziness in the background, creating that three dimensionality, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, I see my photography is really two parts. There's the pre-planned structured shooting where it's like, all right, I'm going to go here this day, this week. I've scouted this on Google earth. I've got to get a boat here, hike up there or a helicopter, drop me out there, whatever it is. And then there's the other part where it's like, holy moly, this system's rolling in tomorrow and this is going to create some amazing type of conditions. I'm just going to get out there and see what unfolds. And that's more the spontaneous sporadic side where it's just, you know, reacting to what you see and, and just letting nature speak to you. So you've got all those aspects. And then, of course, shooting raw files. And I think you'd be familiar with raw files in a camera. It's basically, it's like developing film. You know, we shoot these high resolution images you put them in the computer and they're just stripped of everything. It doesn't, even a, an iPhone, when you just take a single photo on the iPhone, it has all presets, contrast and saturation built in. It, it, it's already been edited. People don't realize that's still an edited photo. So when it comes to my work shooting raw, that file has to be, it's designed to be manipulated and processed. And I'd say if someone said, oh, what's your editing involved? The main thing is just working with light and the dynamic range that I often shoot towards the light. So that means I have a lot of backlit subjects and then I've got a lot of highlights in the sky. So the vast, and this is why I love painting because a lot of the processing I'm doing, I'm not saying I'm like a painter by any means, but a lot of it is just bringing back the tonality just like a painter would by saying, you know what, 
we need to have the light source here. That's got to be brighter. That should be darker. And this is where photography can go horribly wrong for people because I, I can line people up or we could go out in the wilderness and we all shoot the same place, the same lighting. Once those files get in the computer and then you see the results, they can be vastly different. And it's purely just be because people, you know, we've all got different eyes and different uh, methods and everything thing like that but the processing is such a big part of it so for me once i started delving a little bit more into transitioning the eye how do i make the eye flow through this scene like the composition is going to do that but if the light is not right then people are going to get fixated on the wrong subject and i'm not talking now about the light hitting the landscape it's more saying are those shadows too bright are they too dark is that highlight too bright so that comes into it as well. So, so I went on a bit of a tangent there, but the, it's multifaceted really, the, you know, the whole process for me and everything like that. But, um, you know, I, I'm really intrigued with visual art in general and particularly, you know, artists like yourself because I look at your work and the masters and I, I just study why did they – because you guys have the ability to, you know, to put the light where you want it. So it's often saying why did they do it like that? Why has he got the texture in the foreground – but in the background, he's let it be, you know, less detailed. Little things like that because the camera, you know, we go out, you take a photo, you think, oh, okay, he's photographed what you saw of the eye, but it just doesn't translate that way. I find that it might be there when you look closely, but I, I need to emphasize that stuff more. So I really like to, you know, to create that sense of distance and atmospheres, things that you even talk about in your tutorials. I'm doing it in Photoshop, you know, I'm, I'm removing detail in the distance just to help create that type of atmospheric look that just the camera is not really going to pick up. And my goal is to, to meet nature there halfway and then just try and do my best with it. But anyway, man, that's that's a bit of a, <laughs> a long winded way of kind of getting the point out there. Yeah. But look, my goal at the end of the day is to to experience the moments firsthand. I don't fly drones because a drone is in enjoying the view, not me. So that's why I use planes or helicopters and, you know, basically you can't feed the kids at the end of the week. But um, <laughs> I, I want to feel the moment. I, I want to feel it inside of me and be there. I want to be humbled by nature. Um, and that's where my best photographs have come from those moments. And if it's not doing it, then I'm not taking a photo at the end of the day. Wow. It's so fascinating to hear how much is involved with taking a, a good photo and what, a little bit more about what's behind some of those amazing images on your Instagram. Look, man, this has been a real treat. It's been such a joy talking to you, Will. Thank you so much for being on The Creative Endeavor. Nah, pleasure, mate. Thank you so much for your time, and it's been a, a real pleasure. So thank you, man. Well, I really hope that you've enjoyed this episode of the Creative Endeavor podcast and a huge thank you to Will Patino for joining me. Make sure you check out Will's work by finding him on Instagram and his website. Those links are in the description down below. Now, don't forget, there is an alternative place that you can view this podcast on my BitChute channel. That is linked down below as well. Now, if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. I'd love to see you get notified when I upload another podcast. And if you liked this episode, then click that like button for me and leave me a comment down below. Now, you know you can find me on my website at any time at andrewtischler.com. And while you're there, make sure you subscribe there too. It's absolutely free to do so. Thank you so much for stopping by. I really enjoyed your company. And I'll see you again very, very soon in another episode of The Creative Endeavor.